Here we go. Well, we're going to get ready for our, our Easter mes- message, our resurrection message. And as I um, alluded to, it's going to be a little different. We're going to use some uh, media um, to help tell this story this morning. And I think it's going to be very, very good as long as, you know, technology works with us pro- <laughs> properly. Um, but what we're doing is we're going to take a journey. We're going to ha- take a mosaic of, of Jesus' last words to on earth, the last er- words of the cross, the last words to his disciples. But we're also going to bring in um, different um, characters, people that he ministered to, spoke to, delivered, healed, all these different things that he interacted with through his life, and they're going to tell what they've seen through their eyes. And we're going to add to it, it's going to, it's going to turn into a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ and what God is saying to us today. Amen? So let's pray, and we're going to get in to the first word of Christ. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that your presence is here, not because you dwell in some building made by man's hands, but because you have chosen to live within us. And you said that you would never leave us, you would never forsake us. So we, by faith, can be assured that you are here this morning, that you're going to lead us, you're going to guide us into all truth, that you're going to edify us, you're going to build us up, you're going to strengthen us, you're going to give us hope, and you're going to give us vision for the future. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, your dreams for our life are bigger than our dreams. You want to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think according to the power that lives in us. We thank you for that. And we wouldn't be able to do any of this if it wasn't for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has made all things possible. So we praise you, we worship you, and we allow you to minister it to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Who has the plan? Well, that wasn't a plan. No, no, no. When you're desperately in need, you don't stop and think that digging a hole in the roof of a stranger's house might be a bad idea. You just do it. So we did it. Now we pulled that operation off. That's a story for another day. <laughs> and it's a good one. <laughs> you, you should have seen everybody's face when they were lowering me down all sprawled out on that mat. At one point, I just looked at everybody, and I was just like, hello. (laughs) Everybody was shocked, except for Jesus. It's like he was expecting me. Jesus, he had this big smile on his face. He looked up at my friends. He looked at me, and he said these words. He said, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, listen. I wasn't being lowered down on a mat because I was exhausted from running a marathon. I was being lowered on a mat because my legs didn't work. So when he said he was going to forgive my sins, I was thinking, sins? What about my legs? But I just didn't get it then. See, in saying he could forgive sins, Jesus was kind of... He wasn't kind of saying it. He was... He was claiming to be God. Now, I don't have time to tell you everything the Pharisees told us we had to do to earn forgiveness. Needless to say, it'd be easier to move a mountain than to find forgiveness. And here, Jesus is just handing it out. Most everybody in that room had to be thinking the same thing. Who does this guy think he is? Who does this guy think he is? You can't forgive sins if you're not God. And if you're not God, you can't do this. I went in there hoping that I could stand on my own two feet and I walked out free from sin. 
that's a miracle that doesn't just change me. That changes the world. Romans 4, 7, 8, Paul reminds us of something uh, David proclaimed. In Psalm 32, 1 through 2, it says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. From the moment we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we stopped knowing what we were doing. And we immediately started to blame others for what we were doing. Do you remember that? When Adam had the gall to say, God, it's the woman you gave me. He started blaming his creator. <laughs> what Jesus wants us to understand uh, from the first magnificent, magnificent word on the cross is that we never, ever are going to have a better past. It's hopeless to waste time uh, wanting, wanting such a thing, but however, what we can have is a better hope, a new hope for a, a new present and a better future. That's what we got. That's what we have in Christ Jesus, that, that hope that never dies. We now have right standing, as I prayed earlier, we have right standing with the Father through the blood of Jesus because of that great exchange on a cross. It was our sin for his righteousness. And that word righteousness might sound fancy, but it's just, it means right standing with God. We had no idea what we're doing, we were doing. And that's one of the reasons he came. We had no hope and he came and he gave us that hope. Oh yeah. No, I heard what he said. I heard all too well what Jesus told that man, that, that thief that he was hanging next to. And you know what? It was drastically different than what he told me. You see, the day that I encountered Jesus, I dropped to my knees right in front of him. He had my respect from the start. You see, I wasn't looking for a handout, okay? I explained to him that I had done the hard work. I just needed to know, was there something that I was missing? Was there, was there some good thing that I needed to do in order to inherit eternal life? And you know, <laughs> sell all that you own. That's what Jesus told me. Sell it all, and you'll have treasure in heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. You see, I was always taught that salvation is a reward for a life that is filled with good works. It is not a handout that you give to people that can't muster up, up that can't muster up enough character to earn it themselves. My wealth is a clear indication of the favor that rests upon me from God. I had asked about eternal life and this, this disgusting shell of a man, he's the one that gets it? Jesus told him the day he died, he would be in paradise. 
This man couldn't bleed a drop of goodness that he hadn't borrowed. No. No, that he hadn't stolen from the righteous man that he's hanging next to. He was a thief, and I'm the one that is treated like I've been robbing God all along. I offered to do what I needed to do. This man offered nothing. All he could do was ask for mercy, and, and that's how he got salvation. That's how he got eternal life. It was just, it was just given to him. Like, like it was a, a gift. In Luke chapter 23, verse 43, Jesus says from the cross to the thief, he says, Jesus responded, I promise you this very day you will enter paradise with me. That video we just watched, does that ring a bell? Do you, have you known people that are that way, that that self-righteous indignation is just constantly present in their life? Or worse yet, does it remind you of you? When you're envious and jealous of God's blessing being poured out on another individu in, individual and thinking that you deserve what they're getting. See, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here because we don't know for sure if the rich young ruler was at the cross when Jesus said those words to that thief. But being a good Jewish boy, which he was, I imagine that he was. It was Passover, and the only way to get into the city was by Calvary. So it's a good possibility that he could have heard those words that Jesus spoke. But in this story, I want, I want to take you back, just like Pastor Tom did. I want to take you back, um, way back to the beginning. In the, in, in the beginning, God made a garden, right? And in that garden were two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of what? Life. And in this story, we see both of these trees proclaimed. The thief on the cross, which tree would he represent? He represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? The Greek word that is translated thief is some pretty so strong language because it translates as one who is an evil working person, a violent person, or one working for destruction and evil ways. This was not a guy that just took too many mints out of the bowl at the restaurant. This guy knew evil. This guy was the definition of evil. He fit the bill. But then we have the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler who was good. And now what, what tree does he represent? Does he represent the tree of life? No. He also represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, he represents the tree of, 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 of the knowledge of good and evil because he lists all the good things that he had done. And if you notice in that story, Jesus never argues that he didn't keep those commandments, that he was not good, that he did not wasn't able to keep those commandments that he listed. He never talks about that. But here, here's the issue. In James chapter 2, verse 10, it states, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of it all. This man, though he was good, and he was but not good enough. He was not good enough. He trusted in money more than he trusted in God. This is why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is so deceptive. 
Sure, we can point out evil people. We do it all the time. It's easy to point out evil people. And we judge ourselves and compare ourselves to the worst in society. But God's standard is break one and be guilty of all. See, it doesn't matter if, if the plate glass window has a small BB that went through it or a grand piano. Both, in both ways, the, the window is broken. And we were broken by sin. So where is the tree of life? Where does the tree of life show up in the story that we're looking at? Well, it shows up in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the tree of life. Jesus is the only perfect one who willingly lays down his life down for those that are evil and those that are good. Jesus did not just die for evil people. He died for good people. Hmm. Jesus is the perfect one that makes them perfect giving them life by giving their dead spirits the life of God. Jesus is our regenesis, and that's what Jesus is saying here. The word paradise, this is very interesting, the word paradise that he speaks to the thief on the cross was a Greek word that first was used in 430 B.C. That was before Christ. And it described, it was used to describe the gardens of the kings. It's interesting that above Jesus was a sign. And do you remember what that sign read? The king of the Jews. See, this story is about a king. This story is about a king that has a kingdom. This story is about a kingdom that has a garden. And that's where Jesus wants to take us. Back to the king's garden to paradise before the fall, before sin, when mankind had unbroken fellowship with God. You don't have to wait to leave this earth to start experiencing this truth. By faith in Jesus Christ, you can have unbroken fellowship with God. You can experience the blessing of God here and now. Jesus said, Jesus said, that the kingdom is within you, that he has come to give us life and life more abundantly. Today, rather if you, rather, whether, no, rather, rather if you relate to the rich young ruler that thinks he deserves paradise or the thief that knew that he did not, by faith in Jesus, who is the tree of life, you can return to unbroken fellowship with the eternal, and know God as your Father. We now will look at the third word Jesus spoke from the cross. I walked with him through the crowds, hundreds pressing in from, from all sides. I mean, everybody wanted to be near Jesus. There, there was no way that he could see them all, but he, he felt, he felt their, their hurts, their needs. And so many times he would stop and right there in the midst of the masses, he'd minister to the individual. We were always trying to rush him. No, we, we thought we were protecting him. <laughs> we just didn't understand. And then on that day, as he hung there, he looked at me and it just caught me off guard. 
He suffered so much. I can't describe it. And he looked down at me. And in the midst of his pain, he had to take care of one more person. He said, take care of my mom. He called me brother. I loved him like a brother. And for that moment, that's where we were. Mary buried her head in my chest. And she just wept. And I looked up at him. And I nodded. A little later, he breathed his last. To open the door. So that everyone could be a part of the family. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and 5, so love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. It is not self-seeking. I know we've all heard this scripture at probably weddings. We see in this scripture that Jesus was always moved throughout scripture. He wasn't moved by obligation. He wasn't moved by needs, but he was moved with compassion. And this moment was no different. Not once so far has Jesus spoken of his own needs in his greatest moment of distress. 2 Corinthians 5.20 reminds us that we, as children of God, are referred to as ambassadors of Christ. What is an ambassador? It's a representative. And that's who he sees us as, as his children. And in our lives, we most look like Jesus when we're putting others before our, ourselves. That's when we look most like Jesus. And Jesus said in the Gospel of John that he only did those things that he saw the Father do, and he only said those things that he heard the Father say. And here we see the heart of the Father on display. And we see the importance that was placed on one of the most intimate relationships in anyone's life between a son and a mother. We see a heart of a father displayed. And as Christ's ambassadors, as we go through our own individual journeys and in our lives, um, we need to remember that we have been empowered by his Holy Spirit. That as we walk along, that we can have the same compassion for others, even in our darkest moment. And that, for me, just personally, that, that image, I've, I've even referenced it multiple times through different... Um, opportunities to speak, but that is one of the most powerful moments um, on the cross for me, is to see one who is beaten beyond 
recognition. Scripture says that he was actually unrecognizable as a human. As a human. I don't know what that looks like. Because even if you were, if you saw, and maybe many of us have, I'm sure many of us have, The Passion of the Christ, the movie, um, you could still tell that he was human. But someone who bore all of the sin of all of the world for all time and took upon himself all sickness and disease as those stripes represented our healing. And excruciating physical pain, mental, emotional, spiritual, just torment. And he still could look to John and his mother and the heart again, that heart of compassion was moved. And we saw the heart of the Father revealed in that moment. Um, if I could ask you, please, we're going to stand together and we're going to, Alicia is going to lead us uh, in a song of worship right now.
Oh, sure. Everyone's still talking about Jesus raising my brother from the dead. And don't get me wrong, I, I am elated that he's back. It's an astonishing miracle, really. But for me, I remember the story a bit differently. I sent word to Jesus that the one whom he loved, Lazarus, his friend, was dying. No doubt in my mind that he would come save his friend. But then the day turned to night and I, I watched my brother slip away one ragged breath at a time. The one who healed complete strangers left his friends to deal with the worst heartbreak imaginable. Alone. Well, we all know how the story ends. My dead brother came back to life because Jesus told him to. As sure as I'm standing here, it exposed some flaws in my faith. I thought he abandoned us. I thought he should have been there and he was nowhere to be found. We had no hope that there could ever be a different ending. I mean, how could we? Shortly after that, we saw him. Nailed to a cross. Struggling with the worst kind of abandonment. I mean, the son of God, turns out, was abandoned by his father. And nearly everyone else in his life, too. My brother Lazarus died. Jesus let us wait for a little bit because he wanted to show us that no matter how bad things get, there's always hope for a different ending. John chapter 11, verse 21 says, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Have you ever had moments like that in your life? When you wondered, where was God? See, Jesus' amazing fourth statement teaches us that he knows what it feels like to feel completely abandoned. Those words, my father, why have you abandoned me? He did not say that for his sake, but for our sake. As onlookers in this scene of Calvary looked at an innocent man that did nothing but good, who was beaten and scourged to the point of not even looking human, stripped naked and nailed to the cross, of course onlookers as, as onlookers were mocking and cursing him, of course they must have asked themselves and spoke among themselves that even God himself has completely forsaken him as a curse. 
But in one of Jesus' darkest moments, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, for the unlearned, hearing this statement, it sounds like one of defeat. But for the Jews gathered on that hill that had memorized the Torah, they knew exactly what Jesus was saying, or more correctly, quoting. He was quoting Psalms 22. Psalms 22 starts out in verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from, and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I am not silent. See, Jesus was fully man, but he was also fully God. So it's obvious that God cannot forsake himself. He was understanding our struggle. He was understanding our ignorance to God. The psalm, this psalm is a vivid prophetic picture of the cross and goes on to say that in the midst of complete abandonment, it is God and God alone that is our deliverer, our rescuer, and that God does not hide his face from the afflicted. Even when in the natural, it seems that he, that is just the case. I encourage you today, maybe after your Easter meal, to read Psalms 22. Actually, you should read Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Because it's all a picture of the crucifixion, and resurrection, and glory of Jesus Christ. And see, and see... See, it, Jesus, that, that Jesus actually was putting his complete trust into God in this moment. This psalm ends with another familiar line from the cross that we will also be looking at. It ends with that he has done this, which is also used in other translation as it is finished. Jesus was showing us that even in the darkest moments of our lives, we can trust God in what he has promised, that he will never abandon us. In the darkest darkness of, our, of a troubled marriage, he is there. Even in divorce, he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. When we feel alone and without a friend, he is there. Facing a medical crisis, he is there. Financial ruin, he was there. Searching for meaning and purpose, he is there. Even in death, he is there so that we can boldly proclaim, Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is there. He never abandons us. Jesus knew what it was like to feel totally forsaken, but shows us that our feelings can be a lie. And that we can know that God never abandons us and will come to the rescue of those that cry out to him in faith. We're now going to look at the fifth word from Jesus. A cup of water. Wouldn't have thought twice about it if it wasn't for that day that Jesus south the 12 of us down it was a busy morning we were all doing the business of his ministry we were running errands talking to the townspeople and then he um he pulled us aside that afternoon in a quiet place he spoke for a long time there were no stories there were no parables he just spoke plain, painstakingly plain. The bottom line was this. He told us if we were to continue following him, things were going to get dicey for us. That there could even be physical harm when we mentioned his name. He was not painting a pretty picture. But we all knew that uh, this is going to be the price for carrying out his message. 
I put on my bold, bold, brave face and I nodded in agreement. But inside, I mean, I'm a tax collector, not a soldier. I, I don't know anything about courage or bravery. I couldn't be more ordinary. And I remember thinking, I wonder if Jesus knows how scared I am right now. Not a sparrow falls, he said, that is not in the Father's care. And how much more are we worth? But it's this, it's this that got me. He said to us, if anyone does some simple act of kindness to us, his followers, even like a, giving us a, a cup of cold water, they will not lose the reward. That's how much he cared for us. If someone shows a simple act of kindness, even in the worst scenario, it meant something in heaven. Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. And that same cup of water he mentioned, we couldn't even give it to him. He was willing to die painfully, thirsty even, for our sake. And because of that, my courage grew. Not out of bravery, but from love. Matthew 10, 42 says, And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the, of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. And this is, kids, we need to see things um, from more of eternal value. Uh, more than those things that are of a temporary value nature we must we got to learn to treasure what god treasures what's most precious to him and what is that it's people we see that in john 316 it clearly shows us it didn't you know john 316 everybody could probably say it by heart or at least say hey i've seen that on a football game somewhere But uh, it didn't say that he came for a bunch of good, good people. God so loved the world, an entire planet of enemies. He, lo he so loved. In Matthew 16, 25, it says, If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life, for my sake, you'll find it. And anyone who has seen their need for a Savior and has chosen to receive that gift of salvation can, I think, would agree with me. You lay down your agenda. You lay down your things you need to get done. And, and you grab hold of the only thing that's that's truly significant, and that's salvation experience through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus laid down, I mean, we're, we're seeing that. This is the time of year we remember that, where he laid down his life for us. 
We didn't earn it. And uh, if you've heard messages out of this local church body or been here, you know, we uh, grace is a strong message coming out of this, this church. Unmerited favor. And in John 7, 37 through 38, it says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And I believe one of God's greatest desires is to fill you with himself. Is to flood you with his resurrection life. And then to see that flow out of you, out of your innermost being, some scriptures say, as rivers of living water that just flood wherever you go. That's his heart. And now we're going to be looking at the uh, sixth words of Christ from the cross. I've been caught outright and dragged straight into open daylight. Bystanders gawking, the village women absorbing every morsel of gossip. Common decency dictated that the shame of the moment was enough. But the law called for something greater. My life. Of course, a long audience followed behind. Don't think I didn't recognize a couple of them. Their words condemned me, but they didn't dare look me in the eye. I did everything to try to cover my shame, but I couldn't hide from the onlookers or this holy man whose feet they threw me to. I was finished. I stared at the ground when he said that whoever was sinless, they should go first. They should throw the first stone. I squeezed my eyes shut, grasping at the gravel, waiting for the end of my life to unfold. Nothing, though. Than footsteps, except they were walking away. I looked up. Is there no one left to accuse you? He asked me. No. I don't either. He said, Go and sin no more. how he ended up on the cross. And as he hung there dying, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it, it is finished. That's something different. That's a different thing. It means that something is accomplished, restored. <laughs> he restored my hope my self-respect and my dignity. I didn't even know I had any left. <laughs> On a day when I thought that my life was finished, the only man there holy enough to demand justice handed me mercy. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 reads, He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all, our sins, our stained soul. He deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam 
has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Many of us have never experienced the humiliation that this woman experienced when her sin was pulled out into public for all to see. But all of us have things we are not proud of. Can you imagine that if every thought, every deed, everything that you have, every intent of the heart, if everything that you've ever done was played on a movie screen for all to see? The humiliation, the guilt, the shame. Would you ever recover? Could you? I know that there's things in my past that I would never want people to know. Because although God's forgiving, people aren't. See, this is why we have a hard time coming to God. We know that He knows. We know that he knows, even if it's subcon- on a subconscious level. God knows the real you, and we know that he knows, and us knowing that he knows is terrifying. But the good news is that the real you is not in Adam, it's not in the fall, and it's not in your failures. The real you is in Christ, and in Christ, the Spirit of God comes into your spirit and makes you a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. The life of, that Jesus offers is one free from guilt and shame, free because the wages of sin and death, this, the wages of sin is death, and Jesus was the overpayment that the law and sin required. Jesus is our regenesis, humanity's new beginning. He has freed us from our old slave master's sin and has empowered us by his grace to live a life that God always intended for us to live, one that is in perfect fellowship with God, free from guilt, free from condemnation, and in, in the security of his fellowship. We are now free to move from self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. And when we move to Christ-centeredness, we move from self-centeredness to selfless living. And we start loving our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus not only offers forgiveness, but a complete, a completely new life. A life that is almost too good to be true. Please stand. We're going to sing again. We're going to sing, What Love Is This? Amen.
This is a no-brainer. We do exactly what Jesus said. We go into town, we find the donkey with its coat. I just don't understand it. why Jesus wants us to commit a crime. He wants us to steal a donkey. No, no. Not steal. Borrow. Oh, so we're just supposed to stroll into town, untie the donkey, and... And say exactly what he said to say. What is it? Oh, that the Lord has need of it? Yes, and we'll return it. What does that even mean, the Lord has need of it? It's self-explanatory. Why are you being so, so... So, so, so me? Because you all know that I'm the rule follower of the bunch. I just don't know why Jesus just didn't ask Peter to do this. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. This is so up Peter's alley. Steal the donkey, cause an uproar. That's his thing. Peter is the reason why banks chain their pens. Oh, I just don't want to go to jail. You know I hate one-ply toilet paper. I... Lower your voice. Look, we're just going to do what Jesus says. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? I don't know, a cracked rib, a busted lip, the kind of name calling that'll put you in therapy years down the road? Stop it! Stop whining! Stop talking! Stop everything! Stop freaking out! Um, I, I, I don't mean to be judgy here, 
but someone needs to get the log out of their own eye. You have trust issues. Serious trust issues. You even know how many germs are in a jail cell, do you? No, 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 I don't, I don't. I'm sure it's a whole lot, okay? I don't know. And I don't know why Jesus wants us to get a donkey, and I don't know why people are gathering branches over here and lining in the streets, but it just seems like there's something big is about to happen. Wait a minute. Yeah. Go back. Why did you say I had trust issues? Okay. Okay, let's make it about you. What? Think about it. Since we've been following him, we've seen him give sight to the blind. He's healed people with leprosy. He's raised people from the dead. From the dead? I can't even raise you from a nap. Hey, I think we can trust him with this donkey issue. That's just dead. I have trust issues. I see how Jesus trusts the Father. He trusts so much, even more than the ground that I'm standing on. To trust someone like that, I, I, I just can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. But if you're going to trust someone, it's him, right? Oh. Okay, all right, let's do it. We got this. All right. You first. Baby steps. Hey, when we get there and we grab said donkey, maybe I really should leave like a Benjamin. No. A 20 spot? No. A thank you card. Stop it. All right, I'll trust him. Technology. And you look away, people. Okay. That wasn't so bad, was it? <clears throat> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That is what it says, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Every day we have to make decisions to commit ourselves to the one who gave it all for us, right? Every morning, am I going to do what I want to do or am I going to seek his wisdom for my life today? And this is the one who told us that he would never leave us and never forsake us. He would never turn away his affection from us. In Psalm, it talks about that his thoughts for us outnumber the sand of this earth. That's a lot of thoughts. He's never not thinking about you. He's never not thinking good thoughts about you. And when you wake up, he's just staring right in your face, anticipating your eyes opened. He's been thinking about you all night while you've been sleeping. He's overwhelmed with love for you. And Romans 8.32 it says, for God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. And that's something if, if you have trust issues, trusting in God issues. Think about this verse. He has not withheld anything from us. Why would we ever, ever, ever question 
that he would withhold anything else from us that he's given us through his son. Romans 8.38 says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. In 1 Peter 4.18 it says that perfect love casts out fear. When you come to an awareness that the one we read about in Romans 8.32, he didn't withhold anything from us. When you come to a revelation that the Holy Spirit brings of his amazing, overwhelming love for you, you will not fear. What is there to fear in the face of the one who is love. God is love. And he displayed love on a cross for you. And that is more than enough. Now we'll look at the eighth and the final. My name is James, and I'm one of the disciples, but not the one you're thinking of. I'm, I'm the other one, uh, James the Lesser. That's what the disciples would call me to distinguish between the two of us. Through the years, that's why I started calling myself. That's how I thought of myself. I was the last disciple picked. I was never the top dog. But none of that matters anymore. <sighs> because Jesus was sealed in a tomb. And three days later, he flipped life as we know it on its head. Yeah. It was evening. We were all in this large room and he appeared. And, and when I say that he appeared, it, it, uh, I, mean, I mean, he was not there. And then all of a sudden, there, there he was. And he was telling us to, to calm down. He, he, he was telling us, telling us something about peace. I, I, I don't know. He was saying something about food. And, and I... I don't know if you work up an appetite conquering death. I, I... Needless to say, we were terrified, excited, and happy. Yeah, we were, we were really happy. <laughs> we thought it was over. We thought all of this was done. But instead, he put death in its place. He did it. He did it. And when I look at myself, I see the disappointment. I see the dismissal. I see the lesser. And I realize I'm pretty forgettable. But then I remember, he did it. <laughs> he conquered death. He did it for me because of the cross, because of Christ. I am redeemed, reborn even. He has set me free from my sin. He has set me free from myself. And I do not mind having less of me, if it means I can have so much more of him.
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 reads, Brothers and sisters, consider who you were when God called you to salvation. Not many of you were wise scholars by human standards, nor were many of you in positions of power. Not many of you were considered the elite when you answered God's call. But God chose those whom the world considers foolish to shame those who think that they are wise. God chose the puny and the powerless to shame the high and mighty. He chose the lowly and the laughable in the world's eyes, the nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what, he re, what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent, so that there would be no place for prideful boasting in God's presence. For it is not from man that we draw our life, but from God. As we were being joined to Jesus, the anointed one, and now he is our God-given wisdom, our virtue, our holiness, our redemption, and this fulfills what is written. If anyone boasts, let him boast in all that the Lord has done. What God offers us is not a changed life, but a new life. A life of the Spirit. A life that is being sustained by the very life of God himself, the Zoe life of God. God longs for you to know him as your father, as he knows you as his child. We are the children of God. This life that God offers is in Christ Jesus. It's not just for some, some day in the future when we all get to heaven, but it's for this present life. By the Spirit and the Word, God wants to teach you His ways, the ways of the kingdom, so that you can bring heaven to earth. Should we receive God's grace so that we can go to heaven? Yes, but don't stop there. Allow His life to transform your life now here on earth. And by doing so, you will allow Jesus' prayer to be answered. You can allow Jesus' prayer to be answered when he prayed, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. While most have the goal to get to heaven, Jesus' goal is to get heaven into earth. That's what this church is all about. It's about learning the ways of God and then living in a way that brings change to our community to be a blessing and a beacon of hope. It does not matter what your past is. It doesn't matter how you see yourself. It doesn't matter your education or your current financial situation. It doesn't matter. Actually, that's what qualifies you. God is looking for people just like that, those that, are will, that willingly submit their lives to him so that he can do the impossible through them, a life that makes the world stand back and say that God's to be God. I don't know where each of you are in your journey with Jesus this morning. Some of you need to take the very first step by asking him to come into your life and make you new through the Spirit. See, you must be born again. It's not about good works. It's not about good deeds. It's not about any of that. It's about being translated from death into life. Just like you were born naturally, you have to be born spiritually. And if you've never been born again, it's so simple. You just say, Lord Jesus, Come into my life, make me a new creation, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Others need to allow him to remove the guilt and shame of your past so that you can move forward in his freedom. Still others need to stop seeing yourself in your own strength and start allowing Jesus to live through you. No matter where you're at today, 
Easter, Resurrection Sunday, 2019. The day that we remember that Jesus victoriously raised from the dead, this day you can allow him to resurrect your life into what he planned it to be before the foundations of the earth. <coughs> We've done a lot of stuff this morning, but right now we're just going to allow God to speak. And I don't mean that for this to be uncomfortable, but why come to church if you're not going to hear from God? So we're going to just bow our heads in silent and listen to what God is speaking to us. What do we need? What are the next steps? Where are we lacking to trust Him? And then I'm going to leave it up to you to trust Him and walk that out. So let's bow our heads. He who has ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, receive from him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise to our feet. We're going to sing one last song forever. Amen.
Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life, we invite you to join us as we seek to live out this new reality in the world. If this morning you're learning to trust Jesus more with areas of your life and you're looking for a church, you don't have a church home, we welcome you to join us here and what God is doing here. God is doing something here. And I'm not ashamed. You need to be a part of it. God has an awesome plan for each one of your guys' life. There is no insignificant person in the kingdom of God. You're a miracle waiting to happen in this earth. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the grave that Jesus bore, that he conquered sin, death in the grave, and rose victorious. And this morning, we acknowledge that in Christ, we too have been raised unto new life. And Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you flood our life with the presence of God. That you will enlighten our paths. And that from this day forward, we will see life differently. That we will see that we are miracles going somewhere to happen. We just love you, Lord. We praise you. And we celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.